Welcome to ShipIt.show, a podcast about ops, infrastructure, and simplicity. My transition to a senior engineer started 10 years ago when I embraced the Vim mindset, functional core and imperative shell, and was inspired to seek simplicity in my code and infrastructure. Most of it can be traced back to one person, Gary Bernhardt. He is the creator of Execute Program, Destroy All Software, and, as many of you will remember, the now famous WAT idea. Link in the show notes. I was thrilled to talk to Gary about the operational simplicity behind Execute Program. Few stick around long enough to understand the long-term impact of their decisions on production systems. Even fewer are able to talk about them as well as Gary does. If you enjoy this conversation and want to follow up, let me know via at Gerhard Lazio on Twitter or email Gerhard at changelog.com. I also read all episode comments. This episode is brought to you by Honeycomb. Find your most perplexing application issues. Honeycomb is a fast analysis tool that reveals the truth about every aspect of your application in production. Find out how users experience your code in complex and unpredictable environments. Find patterns and outliers across billions of rows of data and definitively solve your problems. And we use Honeycomb here at Changelog. That's why we welcome the opportunity to add them as one of our infrastructure partners. In particular, we use Honeycomb to track down CDN issues recently, which we talked about at length on the Kaizen edition of the Ship It podcast. So check that out. Here's the thing. Teams who don't use Honeycomb are forced to find the needle in the haystack. They scroll through endless dashboards playing whack-a-mole. They deal with alert floods, trying to guess which one matters. And they go from tool to tool to tool playing sleuth, trying to figure out how all the puzzle pieces fit together. It's this context switching and tool sprawl that are slowly killing teams' effectiveness and ultimately hindering their business. With Honeycomb, you get a fast, unified, and clear understanding of the one thing driving your business, production. With Honeycomb, you guess less and you know more. Join the swarm and try Honeycomb free today at honeycomb.io slash changelog. Again, honeycomb.io slash changelog. We are going to ship in three, two, one. So in Changelog episode 450, we talked about why we love Vim. And in this episode, we will talk about why we love to keep things simple. Starting with a simple development setup, a simple code editor config, very important, and with a simple production. It gives me great pleasure to invite the person that cemented my love for Vim. Gary Bernhardt, welcome to Ship It. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. So... This, I want to say, it's been a long time coming and it has, but in unexpected ways, because I have been a huge fan and a follower since Boundaries is the one that really opened my eyes. It was Ruby, I forget which RubyConf, 2012, I think, 2011. So I think it was 2012, yeah. And that was an amazing talk. Now, nothing beats, in my mind, destroy all software. You call them the classics. I still have them. I still watch them every now and then when I feel like doing something different. And I think there is an art to approaching software the way you do. What's the secret? Well, uh, thank you for that. I don't know what the secret is. Being extremely easily frustrated, maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think probably if we really found it, it would be some some personality trait that's generally considered undesirable. (laughs) But I definitely don't have any magic. I don't know. I just uh, I do what I do. I think there's something to it knowing what you like, knowing who you are. This is what works for me. And apparently it works for other people too. It definitely worked for me, that approach to simplicity. I mean, hearing you talk about how you use Vim with little plugins, I thought it was me that likes to develop in production where Vim has no plugins. (laughs) But apparently (laughs) it's you as well. (laughs) And what I mean by that is Vim with no plugins. Is it a matter of keeping things simple because of all the weird ways in which stuff breaks or is there something more to it there are things that people call like vim distributions where where they where it comes with dozens or even 
hundreds of plugins installed. And if you use one of those, five minutes in, you're going to have seen it break because mm. there's just interactions between all that stuff. Even if all the plugins themselves are correct, the interactions mm. lead to failures, which is like a good summary of software development in general. You know, mm. the more pieces there are, the more they're going to inter interact. And the other thing is I really, I like consistency over time in my, in my keyboard shortcuts in particular, you know, mm. because you, you don't, there's a big difference between using a set of keyboard shortcuts for a year versus a decade. You get a lot faster. You don't have to think about them. You don't even know what you're doing anymore. And I don't want to change that by by changing my editor config over time. So those are the big reasons. I really like the long-term approach. You mentioned decade. Now, mm -hmm. the majority of software developers have not been doing that for more than a decade, right? Because there's more and more people joining software development and they have been around for long enough. It's just, you know, how it works. And it's great that the industry growth grows in that direction. But people that have been on the job, have learned on the job for one, two decades are rarer. And how do you spread that knowledge? How do you explain the trade-offs that you have seen in the decades that you've been doing this? I think that must be really difficult, especially when it comes to complex systems, because there's always this, um, I think, false belief that the more complex it is, the more magical it is, the more things it handles for you. Yeah, I don't think I'm very good at it either. I'm not a good mentor. I mean, uh, I think we'll probably get into some some descriptions of specific trade-offs at some point in this conversation. But even we think about learning things in terms of teaching as, as like a kind of active process. And to be honest, that is not how I learned software development. I basically am self-taught and I do have a CS degree, but I already had been programming before I started that. And I have never had any kind of like long-term mentors. You can do it by just banging on the thing and getting it wrong, seeing what went wrong and correcting, you know. So I have mentioned Destroy Software, which is where I got my fix for screencasts before YouTube was as popular, popular as it is today. And I think there's something even newer, which I'm yet to explore, which is called Execute Program. So we can talk about that a bit later, what it is. But what I'm really curious about, and I'm sure our listeners too, is how does it run? Like, what is the te tech stack? What is the infrastructure setup? How do you basically run Execute Program? Yeah, well, I own the company and I, I'm the lead software developer. So I know how it all works and there's no one who can tell me not to tell you, <laughs> which is <laughs> a fairly unique situation, you know. That's amazing. So <laughs> it's only you to disagree with yourself. And that's okay too, because you can change your mind. Yes, right. <laughs> Permission yeah. to change my mind, granted. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> okay. So before I actually describe all this stuff, let me say up front, big opinion stated up front, most systems are far more operationally complex than what's needed, at least mm. small to the bottom end of medium-sized systems. I have no opinion about large systems because I just don't work on them. When you say operational complexity, what do you mean by that? Everyone means something different when they say complexity, right? So let me say what I mean by operational complexity specifically. When we say that a function is complex, we mean that it has a complex structure, which is there's no time element, right? It's, it's complex now. And if we look at it a year later, it'll be equally complex. But when, when we say a production system is complex or a deployment is complex, that's operational complexity. It's, it's about running it over time. It's about how it evolves and how it's maintained. So it's an active thing versus a passive thing. And I'm much more concerned about it and interested in operational complexity than I am about the static complexity of of some uh, of some some code or something. Okay. So, execute program. Very quick summary of what it is just cuz some of this is going to be uh, relevant. So, it's an interactive platform for learning programming languages and other tools. The lessons mix text with lots of interactive code examples, which is going to be important cuz that code has to run somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, it's a very unusual sort of infrastructure requirement. It's been a commercial product for three years. The code has started maybe five years ago in early forms. A maximum of four people have ever worked on it. So this is a small product, although mm -hmm. most products in the world are small, even though mostly we hear about the big ones, which it's sort of a distortion in, in the way that we talk about things. And it's a bootstrapped company. So it makes real money, but it's, but it's small. You know, it's not, a, it's not a giant unicorn or whatever. So that's the product we're talking about. Here's the architecture. The primary database is Postgres. I love Postgres. I think it's great. It can do almost anything you need any database to do ever, unless you're at truly huge scale. The backend servers are at Heroku. It's a monolithic backend. One repo, 
one server process, that's it. It has some workers with a queue, and the workers auto scale is needed to accommodate load just like the the web processes do. And the workers in the queue are used for things like transactional emails, reminder emails, interacting with third-party APIs where we just want to sort of shield ourselves from from those APIs if they're flaky or slow or whatever. We receive one type of incoming webhook and that's from Stripe. And the the reason that exists is if we create a subscription and the underlying credit card is later expired or something, then we need to know that so we can remove that person's access because they're no longer paying. And so mm-hmm. Stripe hits a webhook, hits us with a webhook for that. And then we get to the, the the weird part, which is how do we execute the code that the user is putting into these exercises? So we have a fleet of executor VMs that exist only for this purpose. They scale up and down as needed to handle whatever user load we have, because you know if there's a, if a peak, it could be a lot of these VMs and they're expensive. And it's a very difficult process because they have to be security hardened because they're running ar- completely arbitrary user code ultimately. And if we don't harden them and, you know, firewalls and all that stuff and sandboxes, then people are going to send spam or mine Bitcoin or, you know, do all kinds of nefarious things. Mm -hmm. They also have the wrinkle that as the code is executing, they're they're putting tracing information into the queue, which ultimately gets aggregated into the database so that we can debug things when things go wrong, because it's ultimately a distributed system executing arbitrary code. It's like a quite complex problem. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is, is the most like difficult part of the architecture. So it's Postgres, a single backend, workers with a queue, Stripe webhooks coming in, and executor VMs. That's basically the architecture, which I think is like, this is pretty normal, I would say. Well, the executor VMs are weird because it's a specific property of our problem space. But I think this design is pretty normal and and not particularly complex. So I'm wondering how much of this simplicity is down to you being the sole architect, implementer, and debugger of this architecture. Certainly that's a factor. I mean, I'm not the I'm not the sole person working on it, although it mm-hmm. is definitely fair to say I've made all of the sort of architectural decisions. And I do like to keep things simple. I also sometimes <clears throat> lie in public to make a point, which I have done okay. here. I'm sorry I lied to you. You knew I was going to lie, but you didn't know what I was going to lie about. No, no, no. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to lie. Okay. Is it too early for the reveal? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. I still have a few follow-up questions before oh, oh, okay. you do that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Then I, I didn't lie. I, I would never lie. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> no let's, follow, let, follow let's just keep please, going with this. Please follow up. Yes. Okay. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Fire Hydrant. Fire Hydrant is the reliability platform for every developer. Incidents, they impact everyone, not just SREs. They give teams the tools to maintain service catalogs, respond to incidents, communicate through status pages, and learn with retrospectives. What would normally be manual, error-prone tasks across the entire spectrum are responding to an incident. They can all be automated in every way with Fire Hydrant. They have incident tooling to manage incidents of any type with any severity with consistency declare and mitigate incidents all from inside slack service catalogs allow service owners to improve operational maturity and document all your deploys in your service catalog incident analytics allow you to extract meaningful insights about your reliability over any facet of your incident or the people who respond to them and at the heart of it all incident run books they let you create custom automation rules convert manual tasks into automated reliable repeatable sequences that run when you want you can create slack channels jira tickets zoom bridges instantly after declaring an incident now your processes can be consistent and automatic. The next step is to try it free. Small teams up to 10 people can get started for free with all Fire Hydrant features included. No credit card is required. Get started at firehydrant.io. Again, firehydrant.io. So I'm wondering if you were part of a team where there's like two, three of you and each have strong opinions, 
and especially the K opinion. We should use Kubernetes because why not? It's really important. And someone else say says, no, not Kubernetes, let's use maybe Knative. At that point, there are three opinions. Which one do you go for? And each of these are strongly held. It's very difficult for me to answer because I have no actual experience with Kubernetes or anything in that ecosystem. Generally speaking, for things like that, for, for very high risk, potentially high cost modifications where I, I, I don't know what it's going to look like, mm -hmm. I like to prototype them. So usually I want to do that in a, in a sort of simplified form first and see how it goes. For example, we were considering, I was, I was considering doing server-side rendering mm -hmm. for everything, for SEO reasons. So I, I manually made the landing page uh, server-side rendered, mm -hmm. waited a couple months, nothing happened. So I just rolled it back. So I'm not going to take on that complexity if it doesn't actually make the difference it's supposed to make. Yeah. So I would try to do something like that. I don't know if that would really apply here because we're talking about infrastructure. We could probably prototype it, deploy it, not to users, but just leave it running and, and see how it goes. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing that stops you from running multiple side-by-side -side copies of your infrastructure and just only sending users to one of them. Oh, yes. You could do that. And you could push every deploy to each of them and see, like, what happens over time? How does it feel? So I might consider something like that, but I, like I said, this is this is outside my my area yeah. of expertise. I'm amazed that you settled on this setup single person, and I settled on Kubernetes single person. <laughs> I had other reasons for it. Okay, so it wasn't just like let's just use Kubernetes. It was also for the content. It was also for a couple of things that I thought we needed to do, and then I realized actually, you know what? We can delegate them to some other third parties, so like a software as a service. Now. With that case, we have to manage those. So it's like a bit less obvious where all these things are rather than having everything in a single place. So like, for example, managing DNS, managing certs is not all in one place. And when you have a platform as a service like Heroku, a lot of those concerns like certificates, for example, they're just managed and it's there. You don't have to worry about it. In our case, you also had a CDN. So how do you get the certificates to the CDN? Then you have to start writing like your own things that get those certs from the platform to the CD and if it's not built in. So there's like complexity like that, which is hidden. And then you may feel good about yourself about solving it in your own way, but maybe there's something that you can just leverage. And you know that's what we end up doing. And this evolution, so we started with Docker, we went to Kubernetes, and now we're going, we went to a PaaS again, which is not too different from Heroku, just you know, has a couple of like nice features. In all this time, that simplicity that you talk about, it's always worth bearing in mind. What is the simplest thing that we can do and get away with it? And in your case, what you settled on, I'm sure it worked really well, but I'm wondering were there moments when things broke, especially that queue, because I'm intrigued about that queue. What is that queue? How does it work? I mean, tell me more about it. I think, I think there's something there. Can I reveal the lie now? Yeah, you can, you can, because I, th I think that that was the one. <laughs> so I okay, just wanted yeah, like, yeah. to like, like, like zone in on it, because I think I know what it is, but go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's interesting to see you have an idea. Right, well, queues are notorious, and queue is never broken, but the reason it hasn't broken is because it doesn't actually exist. Uh, that was <laughs> the no queue. Way. <laughs> the, queue, the queue was a lie. Okay. <laughs> in fact, most of the details of that architecture were lies, because... Most of that stuff just doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, it's not necessary. So that architecture that I described, despite sounding, I, th I think I tried to make it sort of on the, on the simple end of what would sound pretty normal. It uh, did. That is massively, okay, good. Except the queue. <laughs> the queue is like, Except the queue. Uh, I'm not okay. sure about that one. Mm. <laughs> Do you need a queue? Okay. Like you need a database. Okay, sure. Yeah, you need a database. Yeah, <laughs> there is a database. Uh, <laughs> but it was massively overcomplicated. And I know that because because we don't have that stuff. So okay. now let me describe the actual system. <laughs> oh, this is too good. All right. You can sneak like a little, a little while. Let's see. Let's see how much of this is true. <laughs> <laughs> no, no more lies. 75% correct. <laughs> <laughs> so going through those same things in order, the primary database is Postgres. I do love Postgres. It's great. The backend servers are at Heroku and they are a single process, monolithic, mm -hmm. one repo, one service. Fixed number of dynos, though. We don't bother with auto-scaling. We just have a bunch of headroom. The thing is quite efficient. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't need to auto-scale. So here are the things that are actually different. Everything else is different. There's no queue. Mm -hmm. There's exactly, there is a worker process. There's exactly one worker process. Never zero, never two. I mean, it could handle, it wouldn't be bad if there were zero or two, but there are just, there's just always one just by yeah. convention, I guess. So no auto-scaling or manual scaling on that. 
no cue. I think I said that. Mm -hmm. So the way that the worker works is that every hour it wakes up and it sends some reminder emails and does a little bit of housekeeping rel related to building stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it just, it just sleeps. It just sleeps for an hour and then an hour later it wakes up and does it again. So what that means though, is that a lot of things that are often put into queues, things like sending an email or anything you wouldn't want to block the request flow, we just let those block. So for example, when you register an account, you don't see a success message until the API backend has sent the confirmation email to our email provider. Mm -hmm. And it's fine, you know, like nothing bad happens. <laughs> okay. And this means we avoid all the problems with queues, like operations getting split in two pieces, the before queue and after mm -hmm. queue part, back pressure management and, you know, migration problems where you change the data format of a queue entry, but there are potentially queue oh, entries yes. live in prod when you make that change. It's none of that stuff exists. So... Whenever I tell, reveal, explain one of these lies, I wanna, I wanna show the trade-offs that we could have made versus the trade-offs that we actually did make. Mm -hmm. So the bad trade-off that we could have made was to think that we cannot suffer an extra 50 milliseconds of blocking registration or a few other inf infrequent operations. Mm -hmm. Also thinking we must gracefully handle any failures in our upstream email provider and be able to retry from the queue. And so we have to have a queue in workers to, to process that kind of stuff. But the good trade-off that we actually made is I don't care. The users can wait 50 milliseconds. It's fine. It's registration. I wouldn't do that on every page load, of course, but it's fine. Yeah. And in three years of operation, uh, commercial operation, our upstream email provider has never had an outage that caused them to reject an email th that was going out. We've okay. had like spam marking problems and stuff like everybody does, but we've never actually had a problem because of this. Since they're so amazing, can you mention their name? Because I'm curious. Who are they? Who's this amazing company? I would not recommend them, so I kind of don't want to say it. <laughs> All right, okay. All right. <laughs> not for this reason. Not they are very reliable in this way, but they but there have we've had significant spam problems and the support has not been great I see. and will just tell us problems don't exist when I have like, you know, I can see them happening. So So in the next three years, if you come across an email provider <laughs> that is good yeah, yeah. and you enjoy do tell us about it when i have a good one i'll, I'll come back for a 45 second podcast and i'll be like <laughs> x is good <laughs> well you remember it's the lie first then the real thing i'm sure we can make it at least 90 seconds long yes <laughs> you should write your own smtp client <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but anyway so before, so wrapping up the queue part we batch this stuff up in that worker but currently all the work that it does takes about 45 seconds total mm -hmm. and it does that once an hour so there's a massive amount of headroom to, you know, we could easily grow by 100x before we even had to think seriously about any kind of optimization there. Yeah. Okay, so that was the first thing that doesn't actually need to exist. The second thing is the Stripe webhooks. I did not mention that if you have, if you're using Stripe webhooks, they need to work in dev, right? Because you have to be able to actually exercise the things you're changing about the system. Yeah. And so Stripe has this mechanism where they basically forward the webhooks into your local machine because you don't have a publicly exposed IP address normally. And unfortunately, I found that to be unreliable. Sometimes webhooks don't show up in dev. In prod, I'm sure it's fine, but in dev, they didn't show up. And you can find a lot of GitHub issues about this too. So it's it's not just me. And I don't ever want to find myself asking, is our billing code broken or is this just Stripe webhooks being flaky? Mm. Like that is not a comfortable question. You know, I am I am very conservative about billing code. So how do we handle that situation where someone subscribes with a credit card and then the credit card eventually expires? The answer is one of the things that the worker does when it wakes up is it just, it hits Stripe with a, a fairly subtle query that gets all the subscriptions that might have expired recently. Okay. And it just processes all of those all the way through. And, you know, it's never going to be very many because this is an uncommon thing. And it was kind of tricky to write, but it's less tricky than than this having flaky webhooks. Okay. So the trade-offs here, the bad trade-off that would have led me to use webhooks would be if I thought we cannot have the users have free access to the product for like even an hour after their credit card expires. We must process cancellations immediately via webhooks. Even though it complicates dev, it complicates CI, it complicates prod, and it's flaky. And the good trade-off is we don't care if the user has free access for an hour or a month, frankly, if they like the product, they're gonna, they're gonna re resubscribe whenever the thing gets actually canceled. Mm -hmm. So it's a gift to them and the operational simplicity is a gift to us ourselves and everybody is better for it. Mm -hmm. We would be building, by, by using those webhooks, we would be building a real solution to an imagined problem because it's not actually a problem. Okay, so that's the webhooks. So the final lie was those executor VMs. If we ran VMs that ran, that, that ran user code, attackers would inevitably attack them. 
it's free compute for them. You know, mm -hmm. the bad trade-off is we run the user code in the executor VMs. We incur two network round trips from the browser. This code is typed into the browser, so you've got a bunch of latency added there. We have to security harden those things, firewalls, sandboxing, constantly staying on top of security patches. Even if those upgrades potentially conflict with the content of the courses, we have to take them because we can't have insecure executor VMs. It's a huge amount of risk, a huge amount of cost, adds latency. And what we actually did, the good trade-off is, we just run the user's code in the browser. And that requires us to build some infrastructure, but we ship the entire TypeScript compiler to your browser. We ship Babel to your browser. We ship SQLite to your browser, compiled the WASM. We, we send a lot of bytes over the network, which is a downside, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's much better because once it's loaded, the, the responsiveness is, is fantastic and our, our lives are easier. And you know that works only because the things we need to do can be done that way. But suppose we want to make a course on Node, which we can't really run in the browser. Mm -hmm. I would like to, but I just I don't do that because that is part of the trade-off, right? The trade-off exists not just like does it make the code complex, not just does it make production operations complex. We also have to make trade-offs across product decisions, across business decisions, in our case, across content decisions. What courses do we make? Mm -hmm. How costly would it be in other domains if we did that? So the queue doesn't exist, the webhooks don't exist, the executor VMs don't exist. The actual architecture is just Postgres, monolithic backend, a single worker process that wakes up once per hour. That's basically it. So in conclusion, I think it's safe to say that you optimized for no watts. Zero watts is good. <laughs> Anything above zero, not so good. <laughs> is that what happened here? True. I mean, uh, I don't know if I achieved zero, but uh, <laughs> certainly, certainly we're trying to limit those as much as possible. <laughs> Oh, that was, yeah, again, like that was one of the best talks, I think, uh, the WAT talk. And uh, I remember giving JavaScript as an example. I think uh, Python, was Python at some point involved in that? I'm pretty sure it was. Ruby, Ruby, at the, it starts with Ruby and then it goes to JavaScript. Ruby and JavaScript, and okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Why do I remember Python? Maybe someone else gave it as an inspiration. I think somebody else did, yeah. Right. I'm sure the equivalent of that in infrastructure exists. I just know about it yet. So if someone that listens to this knows that, infrastructure WATs, whether it's Kubernetes, whether it's something else, whether it's queues, whether it's uh, all those, you know, executive VMs that, that run, I don't know, play with Node, play with something else, maybe, I don't know. I know it's a really tough problem to solve and there's so many considerations. So it sounds almost like too easy to remove them. I mean, because it's it's a hard decision, I suppose, and business is involved and product is involved. And I think it requires almost like a special type of perspective because you need to hold all perspectives and you need to be you need to have the authority to make the call and not argue amongst yourselves why this and why that. And I think that's like a privilege, but I really like what you said that it's a gift. It's a gift to your users. It's a gift to your business. It's a gift to everyone that works at uh, Execute Program because it just makes things so simple. So you were able to observe this long term, right? Like a decade, give or take a few years because Execute Program, it's been going on for three years, but the Storyl software has been going on even before that. And I'm sure that some of these simple, pragmatic choices have been present in the Storyl software too. They have, but it's a much simpler system. It doesn't have any of this stuff. I mean, certainly, you know, there's no queue. There's, it's basically the, honestly, it's about the same architecture, mm -hmm. um, single worker process, Postgres, backend servers. But, you know, when I was building that, I never would have wanted to express opinions based on it in public because it is so simple. But execute program is, is, I mean, it's not the word, most complex app in the world or anything, but it is a, it is certainly a non-trivial system. Mm -hmm. And so... The fact that it sounds plausible for it to be complex, but it is simple, is I think a good illustration of that gap. Mm -hmm. And just to you know really drive it home, like I didn't even claim that it was serverless. I didn't claim that it was a microservice architecture. I didn't claim that that it was made up of a bunch of separate repos for the different subsystems, yeah. all of which are fairly common, you know. So if I'm going to lie, I try to do it conservatively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why it was a very good one. You know, like it was like. Almost, apart from the queue, for, I mean, I yeah. all were like reasonable choices, reasonable, like things that I've heard other people make before. So it wasn't some outlandish architecture. It was like, yep, sure, that sounds something that people would do. 
um, that people have done. Apart from the queue, not enough detail on the queue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the problem is that I don't I don't run queues, so I had exactly, to like imagine yeah. like, Whoa, how would I talk about it? Yeah, it's a queue. <laughs> <laughs> Back pressure, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so, I think in the big scheme of things, keeping customers happy and keeping your sanity is far more valuable than the money that you could have made and didn't. I think that's okay. So imagine all the support tickets all like the frantic what is going on like well, this isn't like the the stress of debugging something that makes no sense because these systems are really complicated and despite our best efforts things will fail and if we think that yep. we will write perfect code and we'll build architect and build perfect systems i haven't seen it happen <laughs> and i don't think it no. will <laughs> <laughs> no i think we've gotten as a uh, the sort of culture of software development has gotten much better at, at acknowledging this at least since i started because i remember in the old times, mm -hmm. people would be like, oh, you're having you're having problems manually managing memory in C with malloc and free? Well, mm -hmm. you just need to learn how to do it better. And like, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's your opinion, and I disagree. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that that's not the, really the way we tend to approach those kinds of things anymore. It's, 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 and, and that's a great improvement in the, in the culture. I think just like not being afraid of failure and trying to build resilient systems, but knowing that we will fail, but that's okay. It's like no reason to give up. Just keep trying. Keep writing those checks and the guards to for you to know when things are off and what exactly may be off. Even the printf statements. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, ah, oh, printf is terrible. And I'm sure that's the reason, <laughs> one of the reasons why the code is an open source. <laughs> There's a lot of printf. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just making assumptions, but it's things there, like that. There's you know? a bit. There's a bit. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> is it Ruby by any chance? No, no. It's all TypeScript. TypeScript. Front end okay. and back end. Yeah. 100% TypeScript. Runs on the back end as Node. In fact, I didn't mention this when we were talking about architecture, but one of the major benefits of all the simplicity, in addition to all the operational stuff, mm -hmm. it also makes local dev really easy. All you need is Node and Postgres, and even if your Postgres is a couple major versions behind, it'll work. And CI okay. definitely runs the right version, so it'll get checked there. And so you need, you do need the right version of Node. It won't even boot without that. And you need a, the, roughly a, a Postgres from within the last few years. And that's, and then, and you need, a, I guess you need a Stripe, a Stripe key. And that's all you need to run, to run it locally. So when you say Node, do you mean Dino? D-E-N-O? No, Node. Which, which Node version? I am actually, I have a branch where I'm upgrading us from 14 to 16, right? Um, I think that's right. It's got to be right. Okay. Which is the latest Node version, Node version these days? I have been following it for a bunch of years. I think that the latest actively maintained one that's going to be LTS is 16, which 16. Recent, relatively recently entered its, its sort of like primary life cycle. Node versioning is a little weird because not all versions go into LTS. Mm-hmm. It's like odd okay. versions don't. And what are your thoughts on Dino? I mean, have you even looked at it? I've I've heard of it on the change log from Ryan, but that but that's it. I just l skimmed through that podcast. Yeah, it seems promising. I've not looked at it closely. Mm -hmm. As you can guess, I do like TypeScript quite a bit. But I, you know, if I'm going to bet a company on something and and write and spend years writing code that I don't have years to rewrite, I really want to build it on something that I I trust to be maintained yeah. over time and so on. And, and Dino is not quite at that, at that critical mass point for me. If I had, if it were, if I had a larger dev team with a lot more sort of effort to spend on things, I, I might have a different opinion there. Okay. Okay. So we talked quite a bit about the stack itself and what you run locally. And now I'm wondering how does a change go from commit to production? What does that look like? Because June 1st, you wrote this, Twitter, right? Amazing place. I just needed a small new feature to finish the task I was doing. It took three minutes to write the code, then nine minutes to see and deploy. So it was live in production 12 minutes after I realized I needed it. Can't imagine working any other way. So run us through those 12 minutes as to what happens, because I think that is an amazing timeline and it's a great way of putting it. Yeah, the change itself was fast because it was in an admin interface. So I didn't have to worry about, I didn't write any tests or anything. I just, I was basically exposing like one value in an admin mm -hmm. interface to answer uh, a support request that a user had made. And then the nine minutes is, it's a little variable because CI timing, you know, depending on what VM you get, <laughs> depending on who else is on the underlying machine, but it's roughly evenly split between the actual CI run and 
the Heroku deploy. And the Heroku deploy, I have really no levers to pull in terms of performance there. They, the deploys run on a small VM. You can't change that, and uh, at least as far as I know. Mm-hmm. And I, I have to do the TypeScript build. I have to do the Webpack build. It's, there's a bunch of stuff that kind of has to happen there. The CI, though, I, I have spent about every six months, there's like a CI apocalypse where I like rework it to, to make it more efficient because things have changed over time. Mm-hmm. Currently, that CI build uses all 80 of our circle ci vms that's the maximum you can get without going to like call us on the telephone kinds of pricing mm-hmm. which a small company like ours is not going to do of course yeah. <laughs> and um, most products of this size wouldn't need 80 simultaneous vms for ci but the reason that we do it is an, another of the weird things about this product our courses contain thousands of code examples that are all interactive in the browser, and we really never want to ship one of those that's wrong. Mm-hmm. So every single one of those code examples gets individually gone through in a Cypress test inside of CI, and all of those get parallelized onto those ADVMs. So, mm-hmm. But even with all that, it's four and a half minutes. Without all that, it would probably be, I don't know, two or three. So four and a half minutes for the CI tests. ADVMs, did you say? 80, yeah. That is a lot. Uh, actually, I take that back. It's 79 because sometimes <laughs> the deploy from the previous CI run is still going because CI actually pushes to Heroku. That's the way I've structured it. And so it has to be 79 so that it doesn't have to wait for that previous one. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. That's a very interesting fact. 79 yeah. VMs. Okay. <laughs> Micro optimization. <laughs> okay. So four and a half minutes to run all the tests and deploy. And the nine minutes. Four and a half for test, four and a half for deploy. I see. Okay, 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 okay. So first of all, is this 12 minutes fast enough for you? It depends on what enough means. So would you would you like it to go quicker? I mean, that's oh, what of I'm course. Thinking. Yeah, always. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I want everything to be faster, as does everyone, I think. You know, no one would turn down the speed. But it's as fast as I can get it, and I've uh, so it's good enough. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I am content with it. It is, it is good enough. It does not feel like an impediment, because I'm not deploying even... Most days I don't even deploy five times, you know, mm. an average day is probably two to three. So in all this setup, when it comes to the infrastructure setup, when it comes to the CI, when it comes to how you get code changes out, the tests that you run and everything else that happens in between, how you monitor, how you alert, what is the one area that you're very happy about? Like you're really happy how that area works. And it can be all of them, but I think there's one that kind of stands out there usually is one that you know makes you really happy. You feel like that's the that's the best one by far. And uh, you mean specifically in the context of like deployment and operations kinds of stuff? Yeah, in the context of execute program, like when you look at all the different areas, the one that you're really happy about, and I'm sure you can think of the follow up, the one that you wish was was better. I guess the the one I'm happiest with is is really easy to say, which is that as far as I can remember, in in three years of commercial operation, there has never been any problem that was caused by the actual like operations of the production system. You mm-hmm. know, nothing's ever gone down, no kinds of like nothing's ever been misconfigured in a way where it didn't boot or like because there's almost there's almost nothing to configure, there's almost nothing to communicate with each other. Even if the worker died for like a month, nothing bad would happen, really. Like nothing really bad would happen. Just people would not get reminder emails. That's basically the only major mm-hmm. consequence. So, you know, that's not a single piece of the system, of course, but it's like it's the lack of pieces is, is the best part. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. Okay. This episode is brought to you by Sentry. Build better software faster, diagnose, fix, and optimize the performance of your code. More than a million developers in 68,000 organizations already use Sentry, and that includes us. Here's the easiest way to try Sentry. Head to sentry.io slash demo slash sandbox. That is a fully functional version of Sentry that you can poke at. And best of all, our listeners get the team plan for free for three months at Decentry.io and use the code SHIPIT when you sign up again. 
Sentry.io and use the code SHIPIT. And by Flatfile, the leading data onboarding platform for teams who don't want to build yet another CSV uploader. Think of the last time you had to import data from a spreadsheet. You probably got some weird errors. You had to try a bunch of things like removing blank titles from rows and column headers. You probably had to find and replace special characters. You might even had to reach for Google to remind yourself yet again how to save with UTF-8 encoding. Here's the thing. You're just trying to get your file where it needs to go so you can do the thing you're trying to do in the first place. And your customers run into this same issue when it matters most, right after signing up for your product and getting started. The thing you're building, the product, is brought to life by data, your customer's data, the data they recognize, and every minute they spend trying to fix a spreadsheet, just like you were doing, is one minute less seeing the magic of the product, the thing you're building, the thing they just bought, and they're so excited to use. Now, companies of all sizes struggle with this issue. They don't realize that there's a solution out there, and they've accepted this as par for the course, optimizing for other ways to improve the customer experience. Some go as far as creating downloadable CSV templates and building their own in-house file importer. Then they send their customers to a lengthy knowledge base article on how to use it, and it just circumvents the entire process of getting started. Enter Flatfile. Flatfile is the data onboarding platform built to take the acute pain out of importing customer data into your product. With Flatfile, your product's experience is world-class on day one. It's built to handle everything from data mapping, field validation, and is meticulously designed to blend right into your platform. It turns a frustrating process for everyone into a delightful first experience for your customers. Flatfile is SOC 2 Type 1 and Type 2 certified, GDPR compliant, and even HIPAA compliant. This ensures no matter where customers are in the world, they're sharing data securely and in compliance every step of the way. The next step is to learn more and check them out at flatfile.com. Again, flatfile.com. So I'd like us to switch gears and talk about how Execute Program came to be and what made you change or switch gears, let's use that again, from screencasts to a more interactive format? Well, there, uh, there are a lot of reasons, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. One is that software development is, is an interactive activity and mm -hmm. learning about it through passive media is inherently a mismatch. You know, it's kind of like trying to learn to play the guitar by reading a book. You can mm -hmm. learn things about playing a guitar by reading a book, but no matter how much book you read, you cannot get to the point where when you pick up a guitar, you will be ready to play. And so interactive media like Execute Program more closely match what the actual work looks like. And so it's I think it's a better way to learn overall for that reason. Also, just as a purely practical concern on the production side, video can't be edited really. You can go back and re-record a video, but you can't edit it. So because technologies change so quickly, things tend to go out of date very quickly. And sometimes that makes them look wrong because in a video you might say, you know, such and such is true of some programming language. Mm -hmm. But by the time someone watches that a few years later, it's not true anymore. And so it looks like it's a mistake, but in reality, it's just the world changing. And then the third one is video is a much more like kind of personal medium. I mean, I never had a camera on me, but it's, I don't know, it feels much more like a performance Mm -hmm. And you you kind of you have to get it right all at once because it happens in real time. Whereas when you're writing and, and writing code or code examples or text, you can edit it as much as needed. Other people can edit it to get a different perspective. It's just a, much easier to work with. So so there are many many reasons. I could probably talk all day about this, as you can imagine. But okay. So when it comes to how people perceived, or how, and I think it's not perceived, how people interacted with um, destroy all, all software. And now with Execute Program, how did their behavior change? I think that destroy all software is much more likely to be sort of it's it's closer to entertainment in a sense. You know, it's it's which was intentional. You know, it's designed to be yeah. fun to watch. Execute Program is much more motivated by the satisfaction of of coming back the next day, getting a review for the thing you just learned, and finding that you actually remembered it and are able to complete those review code examples. And that feels better to me personally. I mean, both of these things are fine, but it feels mm -hmm. really nice to to have that sort of very material feedback for people and for us that they're actually retaining information. And you can't get that without an interactive medium. 
Yeah, that's right. I can definitely see that, like being able to try things out, seeing what you think you know or what you think you understand is so valuable beyond just like a small exercise in a book or you try it out and see how you can continue, you know, this code or whatever you do in a video. I think that's a, that's a lot, lot better. Do you see this working well for environments which you cannot run in the browser? I mean, you mentioned about Wasm and how, you know, you ship all those bits and it's it runs on the user's computer in the user's browser. Do, do you see this working if, if that was not the case? Yeah, I think it absolutely could work. There, there'll be a bit of extra latency, of course, when it go, when it's hitting a backend. So, you know, we could build those executor VMs. We probably will build them eventually because mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. will want to do courses that involve backend stuff. The bigger challenge is not so much where the code runs, but the sort of nature of, how do I say this, of the, of the output of the code. So mm. currently all of our courses have code examples where the code evaluates to a value. Like if you're in the TypeScript course, either the code's going to run and give you a value back or you're going to get a type error. You know, it's, it's very concrete. And a lot of our code examples, most of them, you're actually typing in the return value as opposed to editing code. Some of them you mm-hmm. edit code, but it's a mixture. The real challenge for us is how do you do a course on React, mm-hmm. for example? Because there's no return. I mean, you can't ask the user to type in the entire virtual DOM that the thing rendered, right? So you have to have some kind of visual mechanism Mm. where you show them like, here's what it should have been and here's what yours rendered or something. I don't know. We haven't done it yet. Um, yeah. That's my main, that's my number one idea. But that's that's the big challenge. It's a, it's a huge UX challenge to build this kind of thing. Mm. And I don't know of any prior art for that kind of interaction yet. So mm. we'll get there okay. though. And we'll get to the executors. <laughs> okay. They will become yeah, real. Yeah, that's a good one. That's <laughs> a good one. Yes, I, I, I can see that. I, I learned about uh, just what it takes to run, play with Docker and play with Go from an operational perspective, we talked with Marcos back and forth, and it is a really tough problem. So like those executors that you talk about, I haven't you know spent a lot of time to think about it, but when I hear him talk about it, I realize, wow, there's a lot to this. So I do realize the challenge that that is, but I, have, I haven't done it myself. So you know, it's, it's difficult to say, oh yes, I have all these battle scars. Ephemeral for sure, super lockdown, read only partitions, even like network throttling so that, you know, like you're, you're so constrained to only do what you're supposed to do, even time constraint. So if, yeah, sure, you can like run it for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then that's it. You know, you can't, and then you just get a clean environment. So there's like a bunch of approaches that you would take to minimize the impact that someone that, you know, is not using it for its intended purpose can have. But even so, you know, it's 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 hard. Okay. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult problem, especially in a world where someone can write an automated tool that registers accounts, even maybe pays for them to get unlimited access because yeah. the ROI on it is actually positive. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. So what do you see for Execute Program, for example, for, for like the next half of this year, but also beginning of next year? Do you have anything interesting coming up? Anything that you're excited about maybe? I do. A lot of it is not really code or even or production related. A lot of it is just sort of, uh, honestly, I guess it's marketing, although not in traditional senses. My big focus, in addition to just marketing stuff, everyone becomes, turns into a marketer in the long term, I find, Uh, (laughs) some, some way or another. But one of my focuses right now is to grow the team with people who are, who are around in the long term. In the past, you know, I've, I've been the sort of the one constant throughout the life of execute program. Other people have worked on it, but they've been contractors and kind of, you know, doing uh, specific things here and there. And I really want to grow it into something where there's a team of people who, you know, if I, if I, let's say, get sick or want to go on vacation for a month or want to retire eventually, you know, I want to have a team that can, that can run it without me. And, uh, I certainly don't have that right now. So that's, that's my big goal. It's, it's organizational. Okay. Speaking of organizations, I know that the whole approach to shipping it, it doesn't apply just to code. It applies to how you validate ideas and how you handle complexity long-term. And most of it, let's be honest, it is people complexity. We call it organizational complexity, but it is people that either you don't have enough of or 
they're like in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if you're lucky, you know, you have some great ones that just come together in unexpected ways and just make stuff work. So when it comes to organizational complexity, when it comes to how you get your ideas out there, what have you observed in Execute program, but also along your career long term? Like how does that complexity go up and down the stack? And it's you talk about it vertically and horizontally and you have a very good way of putting it. But I'm sure that you know where I'm going with this. Well, I will I will give another caveat here or really repeat the same caveat that I said at the top, which is I run very small companies. I've never worked for Google, Facebook, Amazon, any of that. You know, I've mm-hmm. I've never worked on a very large system. I've never worked in a very large organization. So, you know, anything I say, you have to you have to read it through that lens. But yeah. my goal is to understand every aspect of the business horizontally. So by vertically, I would mean like your specialization. Like probably everyone listening to this is is a software developer of one sort or another. We're all specialists in that vertical section of the work, software development. Horizontal, I would mean like, can you think about the marketing in at least an approximation of how a marketing expert would think about it? Can you think about design? Can you think about finance? Can you think about business operations? And I want to be able to, I, I'm, I'm not good at most of those things, but I, can, I want to be able to think about them enough that I can make at least reasonable trade-offs across the whole business. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times what I hear from friends who do work in larger, larger organizations is that other parts of the business are basically setting constraints that the software teams then have to implement. And that can lead to tremendous inefficiencies when you you end up building things that don't really matter. So you have that, you have the vertical component of, of a specialty, you have the horizontal component of all the different specialties that you want to be able to work across. And then you have time, which I guess in this analogy is, is depth, although it starts to get weird to think about, but mm-hmm. all of these things evolve over time. And the thing that really matters is you want like the integral of complexity over time. You want to minimize like the total complexity over a period, a long period, like 10 years. And most of that complexity is not going to be in the first six months. It's going to be in the maintenance. Mm -hmm. And many times, most of that complexity is not going to be in the code. One example I really like to to trot out here is, because it's so horizontal, is suppose you're building a billing system and you're using third-party to process credit cards. And it has two modes. One mode is every single time a charge is run, we make a deposit to your bank account. We mm-hmm. deposit the money immediately. The other mode is every day we do a, a deposit of all of the day's transactions. You might not have any preference, or there might be some reason that the per transaction thing is preferable to you for us from a software perspective. But what does the bookkeeper think about this? The bookkeeper wants one transaction. They do not want 5,000 transactions a day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know it's an easy to understand example because even, even if you're not a bookkeeper, it's like clear right, what it means. Obviously, it's more difficult to do that in more subtle cases, but that kind of thinking, being able to think across d- domains other than your own area of expertise is is so, so valuable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's very valuable to an employer if they're smart, you know, if they, if they see what they're getting. I think this is um, a great, great takeaway. I was going to ask you for one takeaway to wrap our conversation today, but this is it to me. We are so comfortable in the areas that we operate in. And it sometimes hurts our brains to think about how money flows around the business or what constraints is marketing setting for us. And those are some very good reasons we know why certain things need to happen by a certain date, for example. Black Friday comes to mind, you know, the election time, you know, (laughs) things like that. Christmas, you either make it or you miss it. I mean, there's no in between. And sometimes we have to do things in software, in operations, That sounds unreasonable, but the unreasonable part doesn't come from some of the requirements. It comes from the fact that our systems are so complex. They cannot adapt to these realities, which that's exactly what they are. I mean, it will happen whether you like it or not. You'll either make it or you'll miss it. And then what can you do? Wish them away? No, you can keep things simple. (laughs) You can like optimize for all the things that you're not going to do, all those cues that you're not going to have. (laughs) Okay, and make it a reality, don't make it a lie, because you you may not just need it, and you may not need Kubernetes, and I know this is big coming from me, but I'm coming around, you know, I'm starting to realize <laughs> when you don't need it, and when you do, so it just goes both ways, but mm, also like this, both. yeah, 
some of the trade-offs, just be more deliberate and have like a wider, like the horizontal perspective rather than the vertical one. I really like that. And the time. And, and the time. Sometimes you should have a queue. <laughs> Can you give me an example of when you should have a queue? You have to pay me a lot of money to give you the one sentence description of exactly when you should have a queue. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. an expensive answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that. Okay, so if <laughs> if, if, if someone feels rich <laughs> and yes. wants to do that, let's do that. Right. Okay, yeah, I like that. It's like the Wu-Tang album that only one person can own. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Gary, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. I had so much fun. I'm, I am looking forward to next time. I really am. Because I think what you do long term is what has always fascinated me, you know, from your Emacs days to your Vim days, and those were the heydays, and then to Destroy All Software, which was like so fun to watch. Again, I haven't watched them all. I have them somewhere, and I should watch them at some point. I think they're still available, like classics for people if they want to get them. It's all still available. Yeah. But also execute program. I need to check it out a bit more closely to see what it does. TypeScript is like not my jam or my butter. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I can see something there. I can see I can see that simple approach. And I'm very curious to see how it works in practice as a user. Just the experience that you as a user get. Because I think ultimately we're all users of one thing or the or another thing whether it's an API, whether it's this operational, operationally complex or simple thing. And uh, there's a lot to learn, always a lot to learn. And I'm very curious. So that's it for me. Cool. All right. Looking forward to next time. Thank you, Gary. Talk to you soon, I hope. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Ship It. Check out our other podcasts for developers at changelog.com slash master. You can connect with like-minded developers via changelog.com slash community. Thank you Fastly for the worldwide low latency changelog.com. Our listeners love those blazing fast MP3s. Your beats are awesome, Breakmaster Cylinder. That's it for this week. See you all next week. As for my last thought, by the time you're listening to this, all episodes, except one, for this summer will have been recorded. I'm super excited about the guests which will be joining us over the next few months. If you enjoy these conversations, let us know via some feedback on our Apple pod or anywhere else that is easy for you. Thank you.